If I talk really loudly on my mobile phone while you're trying to study for an exam, does this have an impact on you? You're probably feeling quite distracted and annoyed by now, which may mean you lose valuable study time and even possibly fail that exam. In effect, you're being indirectly and adversely impacted by my activities. The decisions of individuals and organisations to produce, consume and invest have indirect impacts on people who are not directly involved in these activities. Professor John Quiggan is an Australian economist at the University of Queensland. He joins us today to explain indirect impacts, externalities and the economics of climate change. Indirect, uncosted impacts are what economists call externalities. Externalities can be both positive and negative. Positive externalities can be good for society. For example, if a sufficiently large proportion of the population is vaccinated against disease, the entire population gains what's called herd immunity. Negative externalities, on the other hand, are often problematic. Sometimes negative externalities are relatively inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, such as a person talking loudly on a phone. But when negative externalities are more widespread, they can become costly for the wider community. The classic example of a negative externality is air pollution generated by industry. Most business enterprises make decisions based only on their direct cost of inputs and profit expectations. A power plant, for instance, may operate without factoring in the indirect costs caused by pollution, because the firm does not bear these costs. However, these costs or externalities are real for other people and organisations in the economy. For example, a homeowner living near the power plant may suffer higher health care costs, or the local tourism industry may lose revenue due to pollution from the plant causing environmental damage. Now, if you added these indirect damage costs to the power plant's balance sheet, its production decisions would probably change. The point is, since the indirect costs are not borne by the power plant, the actual social cost of production is greater than the power plant's private costs of production. This is known as a market failure, and is one of the main reasons why governments intervene using public policy. The 2007 Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change regarded greenhouse gas emissions as negative externalities and labelled climate change as the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. The review emphasised that the cost of this will be borne mostly by civil society. It estimated the potential impacts of climate change on water resources, food production, health and the environment could result in a loss of between 5 and 20% of GDP globally. Today, years after the Stern Review was published, these potential impacts are likely to be greater as mitigation action has been delayed. But how do we estimate the cost impact on society? In climate economics, we use a metric known as the social cost of carbon. According to the US government, the social cost of carbon can be defined as an estimate of the monetised damages associated with an incremental increase in carbon emissions in a given year. Put simply, the social cost of carbon represents the economic damage done to society by each additional tonne of carbon dioxide. So how much is this in dollar terms? Well, depending on the expert you talk to, the computer model and the discount rate used, the social cost of carbon varies widely. The US government puts the social cost of carbon at between 11 and 109 US dollars per tonne of carbon dioxide emitted. While this is interesting, does this metric really have any practical uses beyond informing governments of the economic consequences of climate inaction? The answer is yes. The social cost of carbon is being increasingly used in public policy. The US and UK governments have, in recent years, integrated it into their economic decision-making process for large infrastructure projects. A controversial and important example is the Keystone XL pipeline. This project proposed a 2,000 kilometre pipeline to expand the transport of oil from the Canadian tar sands region in Alberta to the US state of Nebraska. According to researchers, if the pipeline were to go ahead, the social social cost of carbon of the project would be between 280 million and 3.1 billion US dollars per year. This cost to society was one of the key influencing factors in the Obama administration's decision to reject the project. It's important to note that social costs of carbon estimates do not take into account the damage caused to natural ecosystems and the economic benefits they provide to humanity. Thus, the true damage caused by climate change is likely to be much greater than these partial estimates. So what can governments do to address the externalities of greenhouse gas emissions? 
the social cost of carbon provides an important part of the answer. Governments can enact public policies to ensure that the social cost of CO2 emissions is paid by the people and businesses responsible for those emissions. In the terminology of economics, negative externalities need to be internalised by adjusting the price of the polluting activity to reflect the monetary value of that externality. This may, for instance, include putting a price on carbon emissions or requiring emitters to buy a tradable permit. And what about that obnoxious phone call we talked about at the beginning of this video? If Adrian had to buy a permit from you before making a racket, maybe he'd take this into account and speak more quietly. If it was really important for him to speak up, he'd pay you enough to balance your annoyance. Either way, he'd bear the full cost of the phone call.